Welcome to AP Macro Unit 1. This unit covers the foundational concepts of any economics course, which is why it's also coincidentally taught in AP Micro. This video is simply a clipped together video of all my Unit 1 topic review videos without the AP style questions at the end of each video. If you'd like to try your hand at some AP style questions associated with each topic of Unit 1, the Unit 1 playlist is in the description. Also, please follow my Instagram and subscribe to this channel. But anyway, let's get in to Unit 1. Topic 1.1 is all about the concept of scarcity in economics. So to start off, resources are defined in economics as inputs used to produce goods and services that satisfy humans' wants and needs. These resources are typically split into four groups, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Scarcity exists because these resources are limited, while human wants and desires are virtually unlimited. Scarcity can be caused by a simple limited availability of resources or by simply not enough time for labor by humans to be performed in a single day. Scarcity is the fundamental economic economic problem that drives all decision making. Because resources are scarce, societies must make economic trade-offs. This means to obtain one thing, we must give up something else. Like if a government wanted to allocate more resources to healthcare, it would have to cut back spending in another place, like education, to do such a thing. Many factors in economics are scarce, such as land, as there is only so much land in the world. Labor is also scarce, because there is a limited number of people available with specific skills. And same with capital, as there is only a finite amount of money in the world. The only thing that is said to not be scarce is established knowledge. Once knowledge is created, it can be shared and used by multiple people simultaneously without being diminished. This characteristic makes knowledge a non-rival good, meaning one person's use of it does not reduce its availability to others. Topic 1.3 is all about production possibility curves in economics. So as you can see here, we have a graph. The graph shows me trying my hardest, showing the amount of paper airplanes I can make in a minute, being 10, and the amount of paper cranes I can make in a minute, 5. The line you see on the graph creates a production possibility curve. This curve is used to show the trade-offs associated with allocating resources. So if I wanted to make 8 paper airplanes in a minute, the trade-off would be not making 4 paper cranes. Any production made below the curve, like 2 paper airplanes and one paper crane would be inefficient. Anything on the line is efficient, and anything outside the curve is virtually unattainable because of scarcity. This leads into the idea of opportunity cost. Opportunity cost simply means what you sacrifice. I sacrifice the ability to make 10 paper airplanes if I decide to produce 5 paper cranes, therefore making 10 paper airplanes my opportunity cost. The thing is though, perfect straight lines like this one aren't all that common and only happen when opportunity costs are constant, and this is because over time, things might take longer to do, and the fact is that humans are perfect. This means you might have curves that look like this but you can still calculate opportunity costs, though it may be harder, like in this scenario. The opportunity cost of making 40 manufactured goods is 40 agricultural goods, because that is the potential that is being sacrificed. The fact is that the shape of the curve depends on whether opportunity costs are constant, increasing, or decreasing. Anything outside the curve is said to be unattainable, but if new production methods or technologies got added that were faster, it would result in the curve expanding into potential new areas. Economic growth also results in an outward shift of the PPC. Topic 1.4 is all about different advantages in trade. So let's start with defining two terms, absolute and comparative advantage. Absolute advantage occurs when an individual, business, or country can produce more of a good or service than another producer using the same amount of resources. So if country A can produce 100 cars using the same resources that country B uses to produce 80 cars, Cars, country A has an absolute advantage in car production. Comparative advantage refers to the ability to produce a good or service at a lower opportunity cost than another producer. This is more important in determining the benefits of trade rather than absolute advantage. Even if country A is better at producing both cars and computers, if it has a lower opportunity cost for producing cars than computers compared to country B, it should specialize in cars. Meanwhile, country B should specialize in computers, even if it is less efficient, because its opportunity cost for producing computers is lower. Specializing in the production of goods where you have a comparative advantage allows for efficient resource use and opens up the possibility for trade. This enables countries or individuals to consume beyond their production possibility curve, or PPC. For trade to be beneficial, the terms of trade, or the rate at which one good is exchanged for another, must reflect the comparative advantages of the trading parties. By doing so, both can enjoy more of both goods than they could if they tried to produce everything themselves. Topic 2.1 is all about demand and economics. Let's start with a key term, demand. Demand refers to the amount of a good or service that consumers are willing and able to buy at various prices. It's important to note that demand doesn't just depend on desire. It also depends on constraints like income, time, or even legal regulations. Now let's talk about the law of demand, which says as the price of a good decreases, the quantity demanded increases. And when the price increases, the quantity demanded decreases. This inverse relationship is illustrated on a downward 
sloping demand curve. Now why is it downward sloping? Well, for two reasons. The substitution effect and the income effect. The substitution effect means that as the price of one good rises, consumers may switch to a cheaper alternative. The income effect means that when the price of a good falls, people feel like they have more income to spend, and they buy more. And another reason for this is the law of diminishing marginal utility discussed last unit. Take this graph here. Let's say we have the price of pizza on the vertical axes, and the quantity of pizza on the horizontal axes. As the price of pizza drops from $10 to $5, you'll see a movement along the demand curve, showing that consumers are buying more pizza at the lower price. This movement is what we call a change in quantity demanded, and it's caused by changes in the price of the good itself. But that's not the only thing that can affect demand. What if consumer preferences change or income increases? These factors will cause the entire demand curve to shift, not just movement along it. For example, if people suddenly crave more pizza, the demand curve will shift to the right, meaning more pizza will be demanded at every price. Conversely, if pizza falls out of favor, the curve will shift to the left. Finally, it's crucial to understand that economic agents respond to incentives. For example, if a store offers a buy one get one free pizza deal, that's an incentive for consumers to buy more, which will increase the quantity demanded. However, consumers still face constraints like income, time, and the legal environment, which can limit their ability to respond to these incentives. That's so our last video was on demand. Now we shift to topic 2.2 to talking about supply. Let's start with the law of supply, which states that as the price of a good increases, the quantity supplied increases. And as the price decreases, the quantity supplied also decreases. So unlike demand, where there's an inverse relationship, supply has a direct relationship between price and quantity. Higher prices provide an incentive for producers to supply more of a good or service because it means higher potential profits. Take a look at this graph. On the vertical axes, we have the price of a product, and on the horizontal axes, we have the quantity supplied. As the price increases, we see a movement along the supply curve, meaning suppliers are willing to produce and sell more of the good. For example, if the price of a smartphone rises from $300 to $500, companies will likely increase production because they can make more profit at a higher price. The market supply curve is simply the sum of all individual suppliers in the market. This curve is upward sloping because, as we mentioned, higher prices incentivize producers to supply more. But what happens if there's a change in factors other than price, like a breakthrough in technology or reduction in the production costs? These changes don't just affect the quantity supplied, they actually shift the entire supply curve. For instance, if a new technology allows smartphones to be produced more cheaply, the supply curve will shift to the right, meaning more smartphones will be supplied at every price point. Conversely, if production costs rise due to, say, high labor costs, the supply curve will shift to the left, meaning fewer smartphones will be produced at the same prices. And that's so all. we have two curves, a downward sloping demand curve and an upward sloping supply curve. If we were to put them onto one graph, we get what is known as the supply-demand model. This graph shows many concepts we'll go over in this video. The intersection points of these lines shows when the model is in equilibrium. This means when the producer will stand to gain the most profit from the willingness of consumers to buy the product. On the demand curve, if someone was willing to pay the price of $50 for the product, but they actually paid the market equilibrium of $30, the $20 in between these two is known as the consumer surplus, which is calculated by what the consumers are willing to pay minus what they actually do pay. Anything below the equilibrium point on the demand curve would not be a consumer surplus because nothing would have been bought. The consumer surplus would make a triangle on the graph, which to calculate the surplus from that, you would simply do the area formula of the triangle, one half base times height, to find the consumer surplus. The same concept applies to the supply curve. If the consumer wants to sell the product for $10 but is actually sold for $30, which is the market equilibrium, that difference of $20 is the producer surplus, which is calculated by the price sold for minus what the sellers are actually willing to sell it for. Anything above the equilibrium point on the supply curve would not be a producer surplus because nothing would have been bought. We calculate the producer surplus using the same area formula for the triangle, and the area of the producer triangle plus the area of the consumer triangle gets us our total surplus. Deadweight loss refers to the lost efficiency when markets aren't in equilibrium. On a graph, if we were to produce only one product, the total surplus is this and the deadweight loss is this. If a market is perfectly competitive, equilibrium is achieved, meaning there is no shortages or surpluses. And though this graph is used in most all markets, some markets can't use it because of imperfections like ethical concerns. So That's let's review the supply-demand model. The equilibrium point you should know well. It simply means when the quantity demanded is equal to the quantity supplied. And you also probably understand surplus 
and shortage. A surplus happens when the price goes up, meaning the quantity demanded will decrease and the quantity supplied increases. A shortage happens when the price goes down, making the quantity demanded increase and the quantity supplied decrease. Understand that the only goal in the business world is to get a business to be at this equilibrium point. This would mean the business might force prices up or down, or might do the same to quantity just to make the graph fall on the equilibrium point. On the screen now are the shifters of demand and supply. These things are what cause the entire demand and supply curve to shift. And honestly, you kinda need to memorize them. If you are given a question like, if a piece of revolutionary technology causes swimsuits to be produced at double the rate, what will happen to the supply-demand model? The simple answer is, the supply curve would shift to the right because more swimsuits are being supplied. Or if you have a question like, if the price for a chicken sandwich decreases, what will happen on the supply-demand model? Well, your answer here is, nothing. A change in price does not move the curves. It just means movement along the curve. In this case, the quantity demanded will go up and the quantity supply will go down and cause a shortage. Thank you so much for watching. Now if you do me a favor, take a break and watch this video. It's a very cool video I made going to Salt Lake City on my other channel, and I would love it if you could watch it.